Uh, my name is Matthias Gulen, I'm Director of uh, Democratic Participation here at the Council of Europe, which means I'm responsible also for youth, youth policy, cooperation, education, including education for democracy, <coughs> and culture, and heritage. <coughs> it's a great pleasure I welcome you here. On behalf of the Council of Europe, and also like right at the beginning to um, warmly thank all the national agencies that are, are organizing this uh, uh, important event that we all hope will become regular and traditional. Um, now, I come from Slovenia, which, if you ask Slovenians, it's not, but if you ask me, it's, it's a part of the Balkans, or at least it's close enough to the Balkans. And there's a particular type of music uh, that is very popular in the Balkans, um, uses the term music in a loose way. It's called Turbo Folk. And once somebody pointed out to me that 99% of the male performers of this particular art form are using the same choreography and just repeating it over and over again. It goes a little bit like you grab, <coughs> you pull, and then you let go. And for some reason, that's because my brain is wired in a bizarre way, I guess. I find this a very fitting illustration, image, of what we're actually trying to do when we're educating for democracy. We perhaps don't grab, we hold, we pull, and this is about democracy. That's a very important part. We don't suffocate, we let go, we release. Now, this being a youth center, we should now all make you stand up and repeat that gesture over and over again as some sort of bizarre uh, team building exercise, but it's too early and I'm not that cruel, so I'll bring you on. <laughs> um, we had a World Forum for Democracy here in the Council of Europe, organized together with the French government region and the city of Strasbourg two weeks ago, a very interesting event. <laughs> Maybe some of you had a chance to participate or follow it. And I had the, um, I was invited to moderate a panel on how to reinforce democracy in the 21st century with some very important people from the European Commission, um, External Action Service. And as a part of that panel, introducing, setting the scene, was a representative of IDEA, which is a Stockholm-based intergovernmental organization dealing with uh, democracy and election observation. He was presenting their annual report on a global state, global state of democracy, which I'm not sure I can tell you about it because I think it will only be made public in the uh, next few days, but if you don't tell anyone, I will not neither. And what was actually interesting is that the report is quite surprising. <coughs> it came as a surprise to me and I think to many other in the, in the audience because the key takeaways about the global state of democracy were as following. The world is more democratic than it has ever been. <laughs> the number of democracies continues to increase. Democracies continue to spread to countries that have never been democratic before. And democracy has proven to be resilient. See, nothing to worry about. <laughs> I mean, you listen to this, as nice as it sounds, you just ask yourself, are we watching the same movie? <laughs> are we even sitting in the same cinema? Um, but there was, later on in that report, there was a but. Because it said, um, of course, there's more of it, but the quality of that democracy is on decline. Which, in other words, means that uh, there's more of it, but it's getting worse. Uh, which is a little bit like two guys going to a restaurant and one saying, the food's getting terrible here, and the other one's saying enthusiastic, yes, but the servings are getting bigger. <laughs> um, now, I'm not saying that their report got it wrong. It's just that when you look at the way they are measuring the state of democracy, their yardstick, their methodology, it's very institution heavy. They look at the situation to say, constitutions, legislation, judiciary is all in place, they are ticking the boxes, and if not box are ticked, democracy, let's move on. There's nothing typically specific to idea. I think it's very much reflecting the way we were looking at democracy um, everywhere for over the last, over last uh, two or three decades. The Council of Europe has been very much dominated with this approach, still is influenced by this approach. We look at the institutions, and rightly so, because you cannot have um, <coughs> democracy without institutions, without constitution, judiciary, legislation, everything. 
uh, that you need. And we started that when democratic changes started in Europe uh, 30 <coughs> years ago, uh, because also we believed that the consensus on democracy was so strong on human rights that it was irreversible. So basically, the only thing we had to do is to look at the countries that didn't yet have the democratic institution, put them there, reinforce them, and then just you know make sure that we wrinkle out any any little uh, iron out any little wrinkles and, and then hiccups that may come and we'll all live, live happier ever uh, ever after. It didn't really work out this way. Something went wrong, and I think that something that went wrong goes back to that little but in the. Um, Ideas report a uh, decline of quality of, of um, democracy today. And that relationship between democratic institutions, democratic environment, uh, which actually is what has declined, is not really new. It was building, if you think, in the Council of Europe and the European Union from the very beginning. In the Council of Europe, the European Convention has been adopted in 1950. The next major convention was the European Cultural Convention, which is about education, history teaching, languages. Everything that is considered, has been considered, has been considered by the founders of Europe being essential in order to invest, stimulate, nurture, protect that environment, that unity, openness that is necessary for institutions, European or national institutions, to function. We have neglected that a little bit after 1989. For, with all the best intentions, but we have neglected it. I think we are now confronted with the result. Going even further back in history, um, there has been a US federal judge uh, named, believe it or not, uh, the, uh, Judge Learned Hand, who said in 1944, 1945, 250,000 uh, newly um, uh, new US citizens in Central Park in New York, he said, I often wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts. These are false hopes. Believe me, these are false hopes. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. And then he continues, while it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. Now, I would offer a somehow qualified endorsement of the honorable judge's words because I actually don't agree with him on the last part, that you don't need institutions, that it's enough to have liberty in your hearts and minds. I think you need institutions because as much as institutions need a democratic environment, need people who understand, embrace, support, engage in democracy, that democratic environment also requires institutions, requires structures that can deliver that freedom, liberty that the judge was talking about. So. Um, and you say institutions are doing rather fine. Idea says that, and I think they, 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 they are right. The quality of democracy, the quality of the democratic environment has deteriorated, is in decline. And I think that clearly emerges when you look at a different type of research. We're not just ticking the boxes of what is there, what isn't there, but we actually ask people what they think about democracy. And there, a different picture emerges. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, I'll wrap it up. Um, it is in, 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 in uh, a survey uh, which was done in 2000, 2016 by Fulman, uh, it shows that in several consolidated democracies in Europe and North America, support for democracy has decreased. And this study argued that people have become more cynical about the value of democracy as a political system, less hopeful that anything they might do influence, they might, they, they do might influence public policy and more willing to express support for authoritarian alternatives. And the uh, Pew Research Center late, latest survey on the state of democracy uh, also shows that across 27 countries polled, even though liberal democracy is still supported by majority, more than half of the people are disappointed in the way democracy operates. <coughs> um, so what do we do? <coughs> Three things, briefly. First one, where do we start? And I think again going back to that survey shows a <coughs> preoccupying fact but also an important indication where we need to start. The same research shows, because data was broken down by age group, it shows that the least support for democracy is among young people born after 1980. In Netherlands, ladies and gentlemen, Netherlands, uh, it says that only about one third of the young uh, uh, people accord maximal importance to living in a democracy. 
two thirds do not in the Netherlands. So I think that's the indication where we need to start, not only with young people, but in particular with young people. Secondly, I think is we need to know that it's not enough, uh, that we need to address some of the underlying issues that are fueling, that are uh, uh, providing fertile ground for populist um, attack on our democratic institutions. It is not enough to tell young people or any people just you have to love democracy without demonstrating that democracy can deliver for them economically, socially, politically. And thirdly, we need to invest in that democratic environment. We need to, which means we need to invest in people, in their skills, understanding, means of empowerment so they can be active citizens, take part, understand, be interested in, engage and benefit from that democracy. Not at the expense of institutions, but to help to ensure that institutions can function. And here we come to the education for democracy, which is the subject matter of this meeting. <coughs> um, there are two, of course, uh, major categories, formal and informal. If you ask me which one is more important, I would say both. Um, formal, of course, because school is being the environment together with family, perhaps the most important environment where people's attitudes, uh, perceptions, relationships of the world, society are being shaped. And um, that's why we have uh, developed a fancy tool instrument that I'm very proud about. It's called Frame of Competence for Democratic Citizenship, and I'm sure you're going to hear about it perhaps more in the next uh, uh, days. I call it our Swiss Army Knife for Democratic Citizenship. <laughs> uh, I know that. Borrowing imagery from military is not a good thing. Probably most appropriate when you talk about democratic citizenship. But we we're talking Swiss Army. I think that goes. <laughs> that's okay. Not the most bloodthirsty military force in the world. Um, next week in Paris, the French presidency of the country is organizing a conference of ministers of education dealing with two important subjects: education for digital citizenship and history education. In both, that little Swiss Army knife is going to be the central vehicle instrument to achieve policy programs, progress uh, in, this, in these areas. I will tell you more about it, but I'm not allowed to. Um, <laughs> informal, to conclude. Uh, in the Council of of course, that is primarily the youth sector. Uh, youth policy, extremely important, um, because it brings together two things. Uh, firstly, it brings together the critical target audience of the education for democracy, young people, together with a critical resource, young people. Because that's actually what it is in the Council of Europe, informal education for democracy. It's not for young people, it's not just with young people, it's by young people. And secondly, when you look at the priorities of the youth work in the Council of Europe, which is uh, young people's access to rights, um, youth work and youth participation, and inclusive and peaceful societies, it shows that it actually is sort of holistic approach, I hate that word, the holistic approach bringing together not only education in the ways that I've described, but also is addressing some of these underlying issues that are driving that attack on our democracies, um, political marginalization, and so on. <coughs> now, I will conclude, uh, because this is more or less what I more or less prepared for you this morning. should probably just fade out like a rock sound. But I um, just want to say this. Uh, what you are doing, what we are doing here, and when we go back to uh, our, our places of work, is extremely important. But it's also very difficult. And it's very difficult for the same reasons that I've just, uh, because of the situation I described. It is difficult to educate for democracies with the objective to reverse the deterioration of a democratic environment because it is taking place in a deteriorating democratic environment. Because the values and principles and attitudes that we're trying to transmit to that education are not no longer universally acclaimed. They're being challenged, they're being questioned, they're being discarded. You know, 25 years ago when I started the Council of Asylum, you know, what do you do? Democracy <coughs> right? People were bored. Now it's like some sort of, you know, conspiracy. <laughs> and that's really an image of the times we live in. But it just means it's even more important. So what I will just finish and just say, give it all you have. Your brain, your heart, do it with skill, creativity, passion, any other vital organ you can find. Hands. Hands are uh, vital organs in some cultures. Um, so just uh, do it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs>